everyone. Uh, welcome to the first content-based lecture of the course. Uh, we're in week one, module number two. Uh, and the first content uh, lecture of the course is a historical kind of overview of some of the ways that women and femininity have been represented historically in Western art. What you see right now is my presentation tool, which is Art Store OIV. Uh, in its non-presentation form. When you open up these lectures, they'll oftentimes look like this, and then I'll very quickly toggle to the presentation mode that opens it up to look like this. They're all titled, as you see at the top, Week 1, Module 2, and then they have the title that is also to be found in your uh, syllabus. In this case, Problems in the Field of Representation, Overview of Some of the Ways Women and Femininity Have Been Represented Historically in Western Art. You will also find, in reference to every single lecture I give, a lecture guide. And after the lecture, you will find a print of a PDF file of all of the images with little captions that have been used in that lecture to help you in your studying. Now, I don't, as you'll see, uh, label all of the slides that I use in the presentation tool. You can find those in the lecture guide along with all of the key terminology for that particular lecture. The first thing that I'd like us to do here, and the whole reason that I composed this lecture, is to give us a starting point uh, for thinking about identity and its visual representation and what some of the power dynamics are that are involved in questions of the visual representation of identity. Now there's two reasons for this first lecture which is about gender of course. One is that I think it's you know in a way it's universal. We can all in one way or another it doesn't matter what our gender is male, female, transgender and such be thinking about gender. We're all gendered in some way. And so it's a nice foundation to start from. The second reason that I start with a lecture on the historical representation of women and femininity is that these are some of the traditional ways that women and femininity have been represented. And the first group of artists, uh, the feminist first generation, will be really interrogating and questioning and critiquing and proposing alternatives to the traditional representation of gender that we'll see today. In many of the lectures, you will be assigned informal assignments. There is no component of this assignment, for instance, that I'll be giving you in a minute that will be uploaded to Canvas or, frankly, that anyone else will see. And I don't want to do that because it, it feels like policing. It feels like busy work to make you show me that you did these little informal assignments. But they're the type of assignment that I would uh, give to a class if we were meeting face to face. And so let's just put it this way. If you do these little informal assignments, I think you'll have a richer experience in the class than if you don't. But there's no way for me to tell whether you did them or not. So here's what I'd like you to do. And when I offer these assignments, you might want to just hear what the assignment is, pause the video, and then perform the assignment, and then get it back on with the video. Traditionally, there are particular um, attributes that are, or characteristics that are ascribed to men versus women. So for instance, as you see here, it is generally claimed traditionally that men are active, that men are rational. And by contradistinction, we see that women are oftentimes ascribed almost the opposite characteristics of men. Women are oftentimes claimed to be essentially passive or emotional. So for this first assignment, what I'd like you to do is just spend a couple of minutes thinking about what some of the traditional characteristics or values are that you're aware of in the world that are ascribed to men versus women. And just write them down on a piece of paper in the way that I've started. On one side, those characteristics ascribed to men and those ascribed to women. After you've done this, 
you'll probably see that these sets of characteristics are posed as almost opposites, polarities. Men active, women passive. Men rational, women emotional, and on and on. This is, in a way, a quality of most representations. When we give a definition to something, we are oftentimes not only claiming the identity of that thing that we are giving a definition to, we are posing it as opposite or different than other things. When we have such a pairing as men and women, this is even more clearly the case. In Western art, and we're just going to start with the Italian Renaissance, we get a lot of visual representations of women that look much like this. And what you're looking at on the screen now is a painting by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael Sanzio or Raphael Santi called the Madonna of the Goldfinch. It's a representation of the Virgin Mary. Most of you, I think, are probably familiar with Christian culture and the Virgin Mary. Now, the question is, how does this visual representation of a woman reflect the ideological beliefs about what women were during the time period in which it's produced? This is key. This is what I'm talking about when I use the term representation. This is what I'm talking about when I use the term identity or the representation of identity. What we have to wrap our mind around is the fact that all visual representations, representations in general, are not real. They're not necessarily true. They are the visual representation or embodiment of the key beliefs of a society. Right? So at this point in Western culture, if you look at this image, what qualities does the Virgin Mary represent for the time period? And what you'll see here is right in the center is the Virgin Mary. Down to her right, our left, is John the Baptist. And off to the right is the Christ child. Now, you know, first of all, what is the Virgin Mary here? She is a mother. A mother is one of the most frequent ways that women are represented in Western culture. It is a quality that was considered to be essential to women. Women, in their essence, somehow biologically determined, were maternal. If in that assignment that I just gave you, one of the characteristics that you ascribe to women was nurturing as a quality. This partakes of that set of assumptions about what women were essentially. Now let's pause for a minute here because I'm using another term frequently and that's essential characteristics. Today we tend to believe, at least to large degrees, that identity, gender, and race, ethnicity, and sexuality are partially essential. They're characteristics of our biology, but perhaps even more importantly, they are qualities that were constructed in the world around us. During this time period, people firmly believe that identity, gender in this case, was an essential quality of women and an essential quality of men. The idea that woman was a constructed category is something that is relatively modern. And it is a way for modern artists to, and contemporary artists to critique these traditional views. But at this time, they firmly believe that women were essentially motherly, were nurturing. And so when we look at this work, we see, in a way, the epitome of the mother, the most esteemed mother in Western culture the Virgin Mary. So far, so easy, right? But let's, let's go a little bit further with this image. She is not just maternal. She is also incredibly patient, isn't she? She doesn't look, and she probably didn't, let's just face it, Christ seems to have been a pretty good 
kid, one would believe. She, she's not the disciplinarian. That would have been a role that would have been ascribed to the man, to the father, who is the one who laid down the law, who, uh, you know, was the disciplinarian and so forth. Maybe in your own family, those traditional gender roles were performed in your family, where if you were like me and I did something wrong, I didn't run off to dad right off and tell him, oh my goodness, I did this thing, I broke the window or whatever. I would go to mom because she was a little bit more sympathetic, a little bit more maternal, kind, was not necessarily going to be the one who disciplined me right off, and then only later going to dad here. By the way, I also picked this image because it makes me smile. I mean, everyone just pause for a minute and look at the Christ child here, languid contrapasto pose, uh, you know, kneeling back into his mother's lap. The other thing, though, that I want to bring up about the representation of women historically, and this is going to be a weird thing for you to hear, is that, of course, these images are not only reflections of societal beliefs about what men and women were, among other things. They are also the way that those beliefs were proliferated, were continued, and even constructed in their time periods. Or another way to put this is, this is not just a reflection of the way that people thought about what women were. It is also a continuation of past beliefs about what women were. And when they slightly change, a modification about beliefs about what women historically were. The Virgin Mary, of course, has another quality to her that can't go uh, unpassed. We have to note this, of course. It's right in the title of the Virgin Mary. Unlike every other mother in the world, real mothers, the Virgin Mary, of course, gave birth to Christ according to Christian theology while still being a virgin. Now, why was that in so, so important to Christians? There's probably a lot of different ways to go about this, but it is worth mentioning that sexuality in relation to women was always a deeply uh, greeted with a great deal of suspicion. Women were oftentimes thought of as sexual temptresses for women, and so female sexuality was carefully circumscribed by images, the most kind of obvious of these being the Virgin Mary, who is a virgin. She has no sexual, uh, you know, component to her being. We could pick thousands of images of the maternal woman in the representations uh, of painting in the West, but I just stop here to show you another one a little bit closer in time. This is image number two on your lecture guide. The artist is Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, uh, who was an academic painter at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century in France. And this is Queen Mary Antoinette and her children. Now, some of you probably know about Mary Antoinette. She's famous for saying, let them eat cake. She's also famous uh, in that she was really disliked by much of the French public during her reign under Louis XVI. And some of you know, of course, all of this comes to a head in the French Revolution. One of the big uh, gripes about Marie Antoinette or sets of propaganda that was proliferated in culture about Marie Antoinette was that she was a whore. Now, that's obviously not a good way to represent women. Uh, and it was even questioned whether these children that you see her surrounded with were her own children. So as these ideas in the public were coming to a head, in some sense, Marie Antoinette was represented by the artist Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun uh, as the perfect mother. You know, they don't show her on a, a throne. They don't show her, in this case, in all of her regalia. She's actually dressed down quite a bit, surrounded by her children, so as to counter the view that she's this horrible woman, wanton, sexual, uh, and completely caught up in her own self-image. This is another representation of the maternal woman. 
course. This is actually a self-portrait of the artist, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, with her daughter, Julie. And she oftentimes represented her this way. Now again, stop and think about this for a moment. Have you ever seen a male artist in a portrait representing himself with his children? You may have, but it's a very infrequent occurrence. And this type of nurturing that we see here, the closeness, the intimacy between the mother and the child is something that is almost always absent from representations of fathers with their children. As a matter of fact, if a man, a male artist, was going to represent himself to the public, he probably would have picked components of masculinity that were much more valued in the time than his position as a good father to his children. Right? The other thing that's going on here, and we don't have time to go into all of the historical complexities of this, is that about 20 years before these works were produced, a very famous French uh, philosopher by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau had written this famous text called Emile. You see this listed on your lecture guide. These terms will always be lecture, uh, listed on your lecture guide um, right below Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun's name, uh, who proposed that women naturally were nurturers, that the most important thing that a woman could be would be a good mother, and that anything else that took her away from being a good mother was something to be questioned in society, right? So here we have an artist who is representing herself according to the prevailing views about what was valued from women at this time period. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the intersections of ideology, representations, identity, and power. Now, let's think about how femininity is represented or women are represented differently than the way that men were represented historically. And again, this is a huge question, so we're just going to use a couple of big examples. Hopefully everyone recognizes this image. This is Michelangelo's famous David. Uh, it's a huge sculpture that represents what is known as the heroic male nude. Now nudity in Western art has a lot of rationale to it. You know, you couldn't in a Christian society that is basically a bit allergic to sexuality represent uh, a nude figure without some reason for representing it the way that it was represented. And in this case, it's important for us to know that the reason that it was okay to represent nude figures had everything to do with the idea that this nude male figure, and it was always the male nude that was most important, not the female, believe it or not, but the male nude, that this male nude was represented in God's image. Or another way to put this was, in Christian theology, there is, of course, in the book of Genesis, this famous passage that said, God made man and God made woman in his image. Now, during the Renaissance, Michelangelo and many other artists took this to heart. They believed that if you represented the perfect, ideal male body, you were representing the thing that was closest to God on earth. So when you look at this image of David, what you're actually seeing is not something that's supposed to excite you erotically, although, frankly, it very well might, you know, uh, and who knows what people of the time were thinking uh, in their own heads. But rather, this was meant to be like God's image on earth. The closest thing to God on earth is the perfect male body. If you don't know, David is famous, and, and what we see him doing here is this is David as a young man. Davis, David is famous early on in his life uh, for being an example of the triumph of Christian rightness over the might of the famous Goliath. In this story, David, as a young man, uh, goes up against a much more seasoned veteran and powerful warrior by the name of Goliath, and he slays him by hitting him in the head with a sling, a rock thrown from a sling, and then running up and cutting his head off. Now, there's no way he should be able to do this. This 
Goliath is much more powerful than him. He's, uh, you know, a seasoned warrior. The reason that he's able to do this is that he is Christian, that he is in God's image. Now he's actually Judaic, but this is the adoption of Jewish thought by Christianity by this stage. And so when we see this perfect idealized body, what we're actually seeing is a visual representation of the reason that David is going to be able to accomplish this heroic task. Again, it's a rationalized beauty, a beauty that is supposed to appeal to the mind and draw us into contemplation of God. A little bit before this, of course, Sandro Botticelli represented nudity uh, in female form. And what we have here is the birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli from around 1482. Again, these terms and titles of the works are on your lecture guide handout. And let's just stop and think about what the differences are between the representation of David and the representation of Venus. First of all, starting with who they are. One is a, an originator or kind of a forefather of Christianity, that being Davis, uh, David. Sorry. Venus is the Roman name of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, and she was born uh, in, a, in a rather odd way, uh, born from the sea uh, and coming to shore uh, here on the half shell. And what she represented for Renaissance artists and the Renaissance public was the epitome of female beauty. Now we get to the second dominant way that women have been esteemed and represented in the history of Western culture for their appearance, for their looks. When we represent this pagan goddess here in an Italian Christian society, what we're doing is uh, showing her in, in all of her beauty, so as to, according to Botticelli and Renaissance thinker, again, make us contemplate the idea of the divine, believe it or not. Once again, this wasn't supposed to be understood as erotic per se. It was supposed to be understood that beauty, with a capital B, meaning a universal, timeless beauty, good for all people of all times of all places, was something that was part of the nature of God. And so when we look at this beautiful female form, it was meant to make us contemplate God in some way. But let's stop there for a minute, because the question now arises, beyond the representation of this idea of beauty, what did Venus offer, right? What else was she? If David's beauty showed you how that he could go slay Goliath, you know, what his relationship was to God, he was made in his image and therefore he could go slay Goliath, what can Venus do? What is she? And the answer is, she can't do anything. This is what John Berger, in your first set of readings, in that essay called Ways of Seeing, means when he says, men act, women appear. Let's pause with that. Men do things. They are valued for what they can do, what they can perform, their activities. Women, however, are more often than not, and this continues to today, valued for their appearance, for their looks, for the esteem given that. Now, what is that value to society? In general, it is understood as a passive complement to male activity. In this case, the female nude is an inspiration or a muse for the creation of great art. One of the other things that is brought up in this fundamental reading that I want you to spend some time with in week this first week, John Berger's Ways of Seeing, is that of course our views about men and women, in this case in particular female sexuality and male sexuality, are very, very inflected by Judeo-Christian belief systems. What you're looking at here 
is one of the images from the Sistine Chapel ceiling created by Michelangelo. What we see is a, what's called a simultaneous narrative uh, in which you see multiple different moments from a biblical story represented in the same frame. Of this key moment in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in which Adam and Eve are placed in the Garden of Eden, and then they basically mess up. And the way this story goes in shorthand, and I don't mean to offend anyone in, in you know, of Christian persuasion, um, but I want to keep it fast and loose here. Uh, so I'm just going to give a, a brief summary. Is that God places Adam and Eve, who he's created in the Garden of Eden, which for all intents and purposes is an earthly paradise. They have everything they want. They don't have to want for anything. And he only gives them one rule. He says, frankly, um, you know, have fun, but don't eat out of this tree of knowledge. And no sooner is he left than a serpent shows up and begins to tempt Eve. Uh, you know, and again, we're not going to go into the specifics of the story, but the serpent is basically asking Eve to eat from the, the, the fabled tree of knowledge. And at first she resists, and then slowly uh, she changes her mind, and finally she eats from the tree of knowledge and tempts Adam into eating from the tree of knowledge as well. Now, in the Bible itself, um, the story is not necessarily a sexual story, but it has a lot of sexual innuendo in it, and so it was often interpreted as a sexual story. The eating of the forbidden fruit is not just an eating of an apple, or in this case, a fig tree. Again, there's no fruit specified in the Bible. It's rather a story about sexual temptation. Now, in this case, the actor in the story is Eve. She's the one who tempts Adam into doing something that is understood as bad. In Michelangelo's work here, you'll note, if you look at it closely, that the artist has doubled down on who the culprit is in this story. Look carefully at the gender of the serpent. You'll notice that that's a female figure itself. And then look carefully at the serpent having physical contact with Eve and offering up that piece of fruit to her. And then look carefully, and it's hard to miss, at the way that Michelangelo has posed Adam and Eve so as to uh, absolutely uh, draw attention to the sexual innuendo there, you know, the genital area very close to uh, Eve's face here uh, is meant to draw our attention to that kind of sexual innuendo. Once they partake of this Fruit. Once they have this kind of sexual fall, which is all, you know, Eve's fault here, they are cast out. What you see over here on the right-hand side of the image, they're being cast out of the Garden of Eden and left to go off into uh, the world where they're going to have to work uh, for, for their food and have to deal with the, all of the troubles that confront us in everyday life. This is a way of framing female sexuality in a very, frankly, negative way. Female sexuality is something to be uh, suspicious of. Women showing, being represented with their own sexuality was something that was, by and large, um, not shown in Western art. And when it was, as we'll see coming up, it is shown in some pretty peculiar ways here. And if you're wondering, yes, over there on the left, they're all beautiful, Adam and Eve, because they're still in God's image. But as they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they've turned hideous because that ugliness of their representation is meant to show that they are sinful. Now, not long after women were represented uh, nude in art, uh, for instance, in the work by Sandro Botticelli as the epitome of beauty, we started to get another class of paintings, particularly up in the area around Venice, which was known as a, a very, you know, Venetian courtesans, and Venice was, uh, you know, a place that a lot of people traveled to to have a great sensual experience in their lives, uh, despite the fact that they were all, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, hard and fast Christians. And the famous painter Titian started painting, uh, starting in the 1530s, a series of what are known as reclining female nudes. 
Now, again, here, this is one of the subject areas and class of images that John Berger and Ways of Seeing deals with in great detail. So I, I want to spend some time on this, too. What we see in this image, the Venus of Urbino, as it is called, from 1538, is a woman who is lying nude on a bed looking at us, while in the background we see a couple of servants either putting away or gathering clothes out of what are known as cassone, which are marriage chests. And it's filled with a number of symbols that I'll come back to in a moment. Now, the peculiar thing is that I bet you most of you, when looking at this, have a pretty good idea of what this is about from our own standpoint in history, right? If you see a woman lying in a bed giving you what appears to me to be a kind of come-hither look, um, you're pretty sure this is about sex, right? And in some ways, you're right. This would have been the way that it was understood at the time, that there's something about this that is erotic or sexual. But we have to understand that during this time period as well, that wasn't something that was really allowed in a Christian society to create erotic imagery, at least great artists didn't sully themselves with creating erotic imagery. So believe it or not, this type of image was uh, understood also as a representation of female beauty. Now, even though it's erotic, what they claimed was that this eroticism of the female beauty could be what today we call sublimated. Sublimation is a term on your lecture guide as well. And sublimation basically means that you take something that is base level or erotic and you transform it into a higher contemplative form, something that partakes of, in this case, beauty with a capital B, a universal timeless beauty. So once again, about women and their appearance. That's the only thing that allows this to be a class of high art in a way. If the artist had just proposed that this is a, a really tantalizing erotic image and that, you know, we're all sexual beings, so why isn't it okay for me to create erotic images for men? It wouldn't have been considered high art or it certainly wouldn't have been esteemed uh, as high art. So instead, it's thought of beauty. Let's go back, though, to our own contemporary understanding and probably the understanding that a lot of people had underneath what I oftentimes call the cover story of this work, right? The cover story being that this is a representation of beauty with a capital B that sublimates or transforms an erotic image of a woman lying on the bed into something higher, high art and beauty and so forth. Back to that sexualized image then, the erotic image. These things were also allowed to be in the history of Western painting and very well esteemed as what were known as marriage pictures. And there are thousands of these out there. This woman may or may not have been a representation or meant to be an allegory of the Duke's very young wife. The Duke was in his 60s, by the way, when he remarried a I think she was 12 when he first married her, although they didn't consummate their marriage until she was of the legal age of 14. Yeah, that was historically when women were married. Um, it may be a representation of that, or it may just be a representation of the idea of marital fidelity and uh, and something that was considered to be an age, I'm sorry, an aid in the production of beautiful, healthy children. Now, this is an odd one as well, but what we see here then in this sexualized image are a couple of symbols of marriage and of Venus. Again, this thing's titled Venus, but most images of nude women were titled Venus, whether or not the original artist thought of them as Venus or even the original patron thought of them as Venus. It was just a, an easy way to couple these images of eroticized women to the idea of beauty, Venus being the goddess of beauty. So those symbols that we see of marital fidelity are number one over here. We see the, the little dog over here. The dog is always a symbol of fidelity. That's why we used to call dogs Fido. So she's going to be faithful to whoever. And then in the background, we see these chests, cassoni, that were oftentimes given to married couples as a wedding gift. And then we see up here a myrtle 
tree or a myrtle bush. This is a symbol of Venus. And then in the foreground, we see these flowers. These flowers were symbolic of, of course, one of the things that we've already covered that women were very highly esteemed for, their procreativity, their fertility or fecundity, their ability to bring forth children. Now, with all that being said, let's return to her sexuality. John Berger proposes that these works of art show that women appear and that the actor in this whole story, in some ways, is you, the, the presumed and active male viewer, whoever you might be. When we look at these images, John Berger proposes, and I think this is a pretty common presumption in the history of art, that we are set up as her ideal lover. When these things now exist in museums or they exist in this form as an image, you are presumed to be a male viewer and she looks out at you longingly, which is a way of making you feel, let's face it, pretty powerful, if you are a heterosexual male, that is. And that was the presumption. In other words, if you've ever, whether you're a man or a woman, and it doesn't matter what your sexuality is, felt a little bit anxious when in the proximity or trying to talk to someone that you find incredibly attractive, um, this type of work was meant to take away any of that anxiety in the face of that type of uh, you know, uh, interaction with someone you find very attractive because it doesn't matter who you are in front of this image. She is never, ever going to stand up and look at you and say, not you, you know, you're not my type or I wasn't expecting you. She will always be giving you that very passive compliant look. And that's part of one of the things that we ascribe to women, that they are passive, that they are inspirations, that the active component of this scenario that's unfolding in front of us is you, the viewer. Now, if you are not the presumed heterosexual male in front of this image, let's say that you're a heterosexual woman, and it's, of course, not that simple. There are a lot of different subjectivities or identities uh, to people who are standing in front of these, but let's keep, keep it kind of simple now in heteronormative terms, as it's called, the presumption of heterosexuality in front of this. If you're a heterosexual woman and you don't identify with this position of the male viewer, what do you identify with? Good question, right? One of the ways that we form our identity is by looking out at visual representations as models, as exemplars for how we're to act and what we believe is admired of us or valued from us or esteemed of us in the society around us. This image, as John Berger pointed out in the 1970s, and he could point it out just as equally today, is not so different than what you might find in a number of fashion magazines, is it? I mean, if you've ever looked at the cover of Elle magazine or something of that sort, or Cosmopolitan, and you've wondered who these beautiful images of women are supposed to be appealing to, you know, as a heterosexual male or a woman, um, you've probably been left thinking, you know, why do they have all these beautiful images of women on magazines that purport to be for women? And the answer is, or could be, something like, we want to identify with what we believe society esteems from us. And maybe even more than maternity or motherhood, the way that a woman looks has often been the most esteemed component of that woman. I'm sure many of you feel this intensely, right? If you've ever felt like you didn't measure up, you didn't look good enough, if you're one of those people, like I think we all are, that spent a lot of time on your looks, you know, it's because society, of course, reflects back to us that value. The more attractive you are, the more you will be valued in society. And these types of images partake of those qualities. So as a woman looking at this, you might identify with her beauty, with her appeal. Now today, this body is probably not the same as our ideals of beauty, but at the time, this was the idealized body. So women, one believes, could look at this and want to be like her. 
Now, being like her necessitates that you're a sexual being for men. And this is where we get to the main argument of Berger. When he says that women appear, men act, and that women self-surveil, we come to the second of our informal assignments uh, in this lecture. I would like you to think for a moment the number of times as a man or as a woman you've walked through the world and felt some degree of scrutiny or in those situations where you feel incredibly self-conscious, right? You're in a situation where you feel incredibly self-conscious. What is actually occurring when you feel intensely self-conscious? This is what Berger means when he says that women constantly survey themselves. In contemporary terminology, we call this self-surveillance. Men do it, women do it, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality is, we all do it, but it's all a little bit different depending on those uh, components of our identity. Self-surveillance means, basically, that we look at ourselves through the presumed eyes of others. When I'm teaching a face-to-face -face class, I oftentimes do a viewing activity, which frankly, I think students on the one hand intensely loathe, but they get a ton out of, uh, and it is without question the most kind of, um, well, it's the most vocal moment in our discussions. I ask students for two minutes to pick a partner and in that two minutes, I ask them to look directly into each other's eyes. Now, I'm not forcing you to do that here, of course, uh, but I'd like you to think about what that might feel like to look directly into someone else's eyes for two minutes. And what they note, of course, over and over again, is that they're wondering what that other person is seeing when they see them, right? That's self-surveillance. Self-surveillance helps to manage our identity. We look at the world and we think about how the world sees us and we comport ourselves or perform our own sense of self in relation to those norms or those presumptions about what the world wants from us. With women, what I'm saying here is that a huge component of self-surveillance has to do traditionally with looking at ourselves and trying to fit into what is considered the ideal looks of a woman, what is considered attractive or sexy, right? And I'm sure most of you know precisely what I mean here. So then another question arises, which is what happens if you look out at the world at all of these images of women represented according to the standard ideals of beauty of our time, and you don't match up. You don't look like them. You can't find models. And by that, I mean exemplars that, that you can identify with. Sometimes these types of images of maternity and beauty uh, come together, such as in this image by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang called The Source. Now, The Source is an allegory about maternity, believe it or not. And what we see here is uh, a rather young woman holding awkwardly, it seems to me, over her shoulder this vase which is pouring out water. Water is considered to be the source of life. And so what we're really seeing is something that uh, is meant to glorify maternity or the maternal body, a beautiful young woman's body, through a relationship to the idea of water as the source of all life. Now, this is where things get really uh, tense in a, in a way. This is an image about maternity, about women as the life-giving source, right? This thing that's very highly esteemed by society, which women, of course, want to fit into. I mean, just stop for a minute here and make this real to you. If you're a woman, think about how important it may or may not be to you to become a, become a mother, you know, to give birth to children, to fulfill that role that you whether or not it's been kind of your life goal or been a component of your identity, you know it's been around you your entire life. Um, 
And if you don't think that this is something that society really esteems from women still, next time you're, uh, let's say, around, around your mom or you're in some kind of big family gathering, it usually works better this way, although it may work with your peers, just announce to everyone that you don't want to be a mom, that it's something that you just don't care about, and see how they respond to you. It's so kind of inscribed in the idea of what women should be, that you might get some pretty strange looks. In any case, back to this image. On the one hand, then, it is an allegory of woman as a life-giving source. But if you look very carefully at this woman, there's no indication of her giving birth, is there? And there's very few representations of women giving birth. In fact, if we think back to those images of the Virgin Mary, uh, let's say a nativity scene, which are all around, and we've just come past Christmas, so you've probably seen these on front yards. They may even have been in your your family's living room or something of that sort. You know, the Virgin Mary's not giving birth. It's always post-fact. She's sitting in a bed holding the swaddled Christ child. And why? Because giving birth was seen as too vulgar, too base, too, too messy in a way, too fraught with sexuality. And so we oftentimes have allegories of women as giving birth, such as this one. It gets even odder than that, though. Um, this is a classical work of art from the early, well, this one's about mid-19th uh, century. And, and though we don't have time to go into classicism, uh, per se, as an artistic style, what we can say is that classicism was very interested in the Greeks, right, in Greek culture. And one of the things that this vase over her shoulder is probably referring to is a famous statement by Aristotle that women in procreation were like flower pots into which men planted their fully formed seeds. In other words, women were a little bit like incubators. All of the active component to the production of children actually came from the man and the woman was just a flower pot into which man planted that. Now, even Aristotle knew that wasn't the way that uh, birth works. Uh, but nonetheless, that was one of those prevailing fallacies that people believed in. In addition to that, though, what was also seen as vulgar historically, and I bring this up mainly because when we go into the first generation of feminist artists, you're going to see uh, a lot of female genitalia, and there's an important historical reason for this. Look at this image of this woman. She doesn't have any genitalia, right? That's not a vulva. There is no vagina. It's not a matter of depilatory creams in the 19th century or shaving. That's just not what things look like. And the reason that that area was not represented was that it was seen as too vulgar, too base. Now, there's a lot of penises in the history of Western art. Uh, it's a little bit harder to hide a penis, for one thing. Um, but uh, also, it wasn't seen as vulgar in the same way that the female body was. And then one step further, this image is set up so as to create a kind of passive figure that is what we oftentimes call, and I could have brought this up with Titian's Venus of Urbino, the object of the male gaze. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of this right now. We'll pick it up as we go into the second set of lectures next week. But when John Berger points out that uh, there is a difference historically between what we think of as nudity and what we think of as the naked, what he's trying to point out is that in these images of women represented as the nude, they are set up as objects right? Objects of male desire. They are, in a way, the representation of male desire, which then women have to perform or are solicited to perform in their everyday lives. And in this case, what I mean by that is if you look at her or if you think back to Titian's Venus of Urbino and the couple of images you'll see come up, is there any sense of a real human being with her own feelings behind the facade that you see here? Do you think about her feelings or her thoughts, or is she simply an image that is a projection of male desires for the female body? Now, what we're looking at here is another work by Jean-Auguste Dominique Eng called The Comtesse d'Ossonville. 
who was, it's a portrait. She was a woman, mid uh, 19th century France, very important aristocratic woman. She's actually a, a fairly successful woman of letters, um, although she wasn't a professional uh, writer. Women were prescribed from being professional writers in the same way uh, that men were at the time. Uh, who is having Aang, this famous portraitist and artist, represent her. This is a good place for you to test how these traditional values described to gender show up in your own lives. Portraits, while we don't any longer, you know, probably most of us anyway, uh, go to an oil painter and have them represent us, are everywhere to be found. Think of uh, if you're one of those that are caught up in the whole selfie phenomenon, for instance. Um, think about the selfies that you take, that you post on social media if you do that, and how they partake in the values of the culture around you and your peer groups or what have you, right? How many of those self-representations partake of the values that you find in the world around you? This is a way of saying that this isn't all these questions about the visual representation of women as a Madonna or as a female nude. Um, well, they're all very constitutive of our own sense of identity. They're models, they're representations of these societal beliefs, and many times we internalize them. So, for instance, here, if we look back at this image, the Comtesse de Dosambi is looking out at us at what at first glance might be mistaken as the typical philosophical hand on your chin thinking and deep thought about something. But as we look around the image a little bit more, we'll start to realize that she's not thinking about deep philosophy, you know, the existential, uh, you know, crisis of mankind or something of that sort. What she's doing is she's thinking about a recent experience. If I just take this cursor over here and point this out, right over here are opera glasses. Now the opera, in addition to being a place that women were seen in public uh, and could oftentimes go out to solicit the attention of men on the way to gaining a mate, a partner, you know, a husband, um, as well as being a kind of cultural center, this is a, an important place to be seen in the world, to present yourself to the world. Now she's gone off to the opera and the way the kind of implicit narrative in this picture is that she's come back and her attendant has given her these down here. These are calling cards left by gentlemen callers whose attention she captured at the opera. And so what she's thinking about is something like, well, is it going to be Pierre? Is it going to be Jean-Claude? They're both, you know, viable, you know, mates. Who do I go for here, right? And in addition to that, she's also publicly displaying her beauty once again. She's elegantly dressed. She, of course, hair in the latest style. Um, she shows you, or Aang, the artist, shows you from the front and the back so that we can see her beauty, which again is one of the things most esteemed by women historically, or about women historically, in their visual representations in Western art. Now, this is another uh, comparison of a couple of images basically on the same theme by the academic French painter uh, whose name is William Bouguereau. Uh, again, on your lecture guide, just follow along with these. On the left here, you see youth and love. And then on the right, you see young girl defending herself against Eros. What I'd like you to do is just pause for a minute. Pause the video after contemplating and, and contemplate this idea. What do you think these are about? If you don't know the symbolism of these, I think you're going to be at a little bit of a loss, right? Most of you know that Eros, or as he's better known these days, Cupid, is the son of Venus or Aphrodite, uh, and he's the epitome of, of sexuality in a way. You know, if you were pierced by the arrows of Cupid, your passions were inflamed. So think about what you think these things are about. 
what both of these works are about, believe it or not, is chastity. And that is the odd way to represent chastity, but that's what these are about. Both of these beautiful women, uh, you know, completely, well, mostly nude, I guess I should say, are defending themselves against the advances of this god of sexual passion. In a way, it is a kind of um, a moralizing set of pictures that are meant to, I suppose, teach young women that it doesn't matter what that boy whispers in your ear or what your own inner feelings are. It is against your better nature and against the kind of essence of women to go along with uh, those advances, right? Women should remain chaste. Women should not follow their passions. What does this say, though, about the visual representation of women in relation to sexuality? And even, kind of more importantly, I suppose, in some ways, what male sexuality is as it is implicitly uh, referenced in these works. And I'm sure you know this stereotype, right? Young men, well, men in general, I guess we could say, but starting at a fairly young age, at adolescence, are incredibly sexual creatures, right? They want sex all the time. They're always going to be trying to talk you into sex. While women aren't really sexual creatures, um, they just do sex to go along with men. Now, if you're saying that's BS, right? I I'm a woman. I like sex, too. I'm not saying that you don't. I'm saying, and I'm not even saying that women of the time didn't think that. Uh, what I'm saying is that the societal beliefs of the time, and this is, you can find this in a million different sources, really believe that women didn't have their own sexuality, right? That women's sexuality was a function of male sexuality. That women could only be activated by the man. That if a woman showed any kind of sexual inclination of her own, because of her own sexual desires, there was something to be really suspicious of there. Whereas it was a natural condition of men to want more sex. And so what we see here, believe it or not, in these two representations of women, uh, again, objecting to sexual passion, is a moralizing tale that very much fits into the societal beliefs of the time that women aren't sexual beings. As we see in week number two, when we go into next week's lecture, this will be one of the hotly contested areas by early feminist artists, that women's sexuality is not a function of male sexuality that has to be thought of on its own terms. And let me just say this, if you're wondering, you know, if these are moralizing tales about women uh, you know, not succumbing to their own sexual, uh, well, the sexual uh, advances of men, then why are they nude? It's because people weren't really buying these because these are moralizing pictures. They're buying them because they are beautiful representations of nude women, and it's just, in a way, a kind of excuse to show a nude woman. This is what, for instance, John Berger means when he talks about those images of women holding mirrors that are understood as vanitas pictures. On the one hand, they say, don't, don't, don't do this, like in the vanitas pictures that Berger talks about, don't get too caught up in your own looks. They're fleeting. You know, you need to be concerned about... Um, spiritual things instead. These things on the one hand are saying, don't, don't do, do this. While on the un other hand, they are giving you representations of the beauty and the erotic female body that are absolutely supposed to provoke the very desire, at least in heterosexual men, that they are foreclosing to women. Now, this is a case in point. Uh, closer to us, uh, what I have here on the screen now is Franz von Stuck's famous Disunda, or The Sin, or Sin, as is better known. There is a, a copy of this, or one of the three major paintings that Franz von Stuck, who is a later uh, 19th century, early 20th century artist, did uh, of this image. There are three of these around at the Fry Art Museum. So if you wanted to see this firsthand, it's often on display there. This is an image of what we know of as the femme fatale. The femme fatale kind of most famously 
uh, shown in that that Glenn Close movie, Fatal Attraction, for me. That's my that dates me a little bit, but that's the one that stands out to me. Is an example of a woman who has her own sexual proclivities that she actually is an active sexual being. But here's the thing: the femme fatale isn't being active sexually, at least in the visual representations of her, because she has her own sexual desire. The femme fatale is using her sexuality so as to get men to do something, whatever she wants them to do. It's like using the Achilles heel of men, they're all hypersexual creatures, to get them to do whatever she wants them to do. Again, think about this a little bit. On the one hand, men are considered to be incredibly active sexual beings, whereas women have no sexuality, and when they do display sexuality, it's not for their own sexual desire, but rather to get men to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. In a way, she is a latter-day Eve seeking to tempt you into doing something that is against your better nature. And in another way, of course, she is the epitome of everything women should not be. All these things that are negative about female bodies, female sexuality, and so forth. Um, again, think of your own lives and how this does or doesn't fit in with the things that you've been taught about male versus female sexuality. Let's show you this last image of the female nude. It's of the same date as the work that I'm going to show you in a moment. This work is by Alexander Cavanell called The Birth of Venus. Again, it's a, a Venus figure. Again, just like Botticelli's work and to a lesser degree like Titian's Venus of Urbina work that we saw before, this work is meant to be the epitome of beauty right? The female body is the beautiful body that lifts us into the contemplation of higher forms such as God or such as universal values. Um, it was always believed that beauty, and if you, maybe if you go, I don't know how many people believe this today, but if you, certainly if you go talk to your grandparents or something, they probably believe this, that beauty is something that just per se is good in the world, that it's something that binds together society. And so when people are representing beauty now, and in the 19th century it was primarily the female nude, it was a high form of art, right? This isn't meant to be erotic, or if you took this to be erotic, remember, it was a sublimated eroticism, an erotic, vulgar energy that was turned into something higher. And maybe I should pause and explain that a little bit more. Sublimation, when we think about artist creation, was oftentimes thought of this way. An artist presumably male, because most artists were male, might be in the face of a beautiful model and feel a sexual charge in that kind of interaction. But then they would re-channel that sexual attraction to, let's say, their model or their wives or their mistresses or whoever it might be, into the creation of high forms of art that were better than just base, vulgar eroticism. The big reason that I show you this, though, is to talk about what is known as a viewing dynamic in front of paintings. And this is a term on your handout uh, that is referenced by the term voyeurism. Now, I think we all know what a voyeur is, right? A voyeur is someone who sees without being seen in return. The stereotypical representation of a voyeur is someone who's looking through a keyhole or a peephole at something else, usually a nude female or something sexualized. And the key component of the situation is that a voyeur sees something without being seen in return. And this is a very, very powerful feeling, whether or not it's sexualized. If you see without being seen in return, um, you know, you you're not caught up in the question of self-surveillance. You don't have to think about what that other person that you're looking at sees in you. You get to see them. They're unaware of you. Uh, it puts you into a position of power. Now, most of the time, let's all grant, peeping through keyholes, not something that's socially acceptable for the most part, right? Uh, I, I'm going to guess. But here's one place that it is fairly uh, socially acceptable, not looking through keyholes, but looking at paintings, looking at paintings in which women either avert their eyes or barely look at you or look away or give you a come hither look. Those are situations that set you up as the active looking person, whereas 
the thing that you're looking at is passive. Is a recipient of your gaze. Doesn't really have any power in the situation. These are paintings, after all. They're objects. They can't return your gaze. They, in this case, you might see that her eyes are just opening. She's just starting to look out at you, but it's not so as to say, and you would never feel this. No, 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 not you. You know, you're you're not in my league. She's just, it seems to me, looking at, at you to make sure that you see, frankly, how hot she is, right? Look at how good I look. Uh, she's not going to contest any, any kinds of, uh, you know, desirous affections that you project onto her. And everything in this body and in all the bodies we've seen before are, uh, are posed in such a way as to emphasize what were con considered the erogenous zones of the female body at that time. This works from 1863. In the big exhibitions that were held in France at this time, kind of world stage of artistic representation, this one won uh, awards for being the best female nude of its day. So then, let's take a minute here to recap some of the things that we've covered so far in this introductory lecture. That is, again, primarily about giving you a foundation to begin thinking about the way that gender has been represented historically in art. <clears throat> so, first, we started with the idea that for most of Western history, identity was considered to be a natural condition within the genders. In other words, each gender, male and female, was naturally or essentially one thing or another. Men were, as we have said, if we look back at this category, which I've now filled out, I'm sorry, women were considered to be, and very, you know, highly valued for being mothers, with all the attendant associations that go along with the idea of the ideal mother. Women were also considered to be sexual objects. Now this is an odd one and we'll flesh this out next week some because on the one hand the natural condition of women was considered to be chaste and so when we see these representations of women who have been eroticized in one way or another remember they often have cover stories in order to bring them back away from the overtly erotic. Those female nudes that we've just covered were considered to be beauty with a capital B, something that was universal and timeless and lofty, a high form of art. Now, before we go down <laughs> to this extended, uh, you know, bipolar field of characteristics ascribed traditionally to men versus women, remember that it's not just that identity is considered essential. Let's remember that these paintings, and I've primarily been showing you paintings, were visual representations of the societal beliefs that were prevalent at that time. In other words, they are representations, among other things, of the ideology of the time, the big beliefs of the time. So then, down to this bipolar field again that I've filled out a little bit further, it may look like yours. You may have different characteristics on there, more or less, but these are some of the things that, if we think back over all of those representations of women, we'll find fairly consistently. Men are active, women passive. Men are valued for and considered to be rational, you know, more about the mind, whereas women are considered to be more emotional, more about the body. Men's realm of influence is the cultural realm while women's realm is the natural realm. If we extend this a little bit further, we could say that men's realm of activity is the world, whereas women's realm of activity is the home. Therefore, men are the fathers, the breadwinners, the disciplinarians, and all the things that we traditionally ascribe to the father, whereas the mother in the home is the nurturer, and it is her realm, the home, uh, to which she is confined more often than not. Men are considered to be virile, women docile, uh, men sexually virile, even more so, women chaste. Men are judged for their acts, 
what they can do in the world. Whereas more often than not, women are primarily esteemed, again, traditionally for their appearance. Now, this is one of the big ones, of course, and it is fundamentally a component of the John Berger reading, which I've asked you to spend some time with. It is also one of those ideas about what women are that continues very prevalently today, that women's appearance, judgment about their appearance is everywhere to be seen in the world. And you have to ask yourself here, if this characteristic ascribed to women, their appearance is so important, in what ways is it important? Or rather, take a minute to think about which side of this polar field is more privileged than the other side. In other words, which one is more esteemed than the other? Because it's, again, not just simply uh, a situation in which women are confined naturally to particular qualities. It is also a situation in which, on the left-hand side of these columns, those qualities tend to be, more often than not, privileged or more esteemed than the qualities that we see on the right. So women are confined to a particular set of characteristics, a female or feminine sphere, which is not as esteemed as those qualities ascribed to men. Thus, power enters the equation. Now, let's finish up with just one final work here for today. In the 19th century, which was a period of massive, rapid change, including societal changes that you know didn't happen all at once, modern art stopped just being, or primarily being, a re-articulation of societal beliefs. It was not just a mere reflection and perpetuation of ideas about gender, for instance. Art became a kind of social fulcrum, a social weapon, something that could be, uh, you know, a representation used to elicit societal changes in the world. So you're looking at the screen at one very, very famous example. This is Edouard Manet's Olympia, a painting that was painted, although it was not exhibited at that time, in the same year as Alexander Cavanel's Birth of Venus, alongside thousands, literally thousands, of female nudes that turned women into sexual objects for male desire, passive recipients of male desire, figures without their own sense of self or their own identity, which, as we've said, asked or solicited women to identify with. When Manet created the Olympia, what he fundamentally did was to invert change that is, invert, flip it on its head, the entire tradition of the nude. He's actually, of course, working uh, from Titian's Venus of Urbino, which is the, uh, the work that I showed you earlier on. Um, that has a woman, that first woman, lying in a bed, giving you a bit of a come-hither look. So if we look back at this, you'll see it, right? He's changed a number of things in his painting from the original painting from 1538. The main thing that he's changed has to do with the title. As I said earlier on, one of the ways to legitimize the female nude was to give them titles such as Venus, to draw them into the realm of classical thinking, make them goddesses of love and of beauty. In Manet's work, Olympia is a slang term for a prostitute. So in the viewing dynamic, starting with this, when you stepped in front of these pictures, instead of, as you were in front of Titian's work, the ideal lover of this figure, who is not contested by that very docile, very come-hither gaze, in Manet's Olympia, of course, you are very clearly being stared right back at. She looks right at you. And so the voyeuristic situation in which you see without being seen has gone away. You are no longer the in the position of power. Now ask yourself something based upon the Berger reading. Does this then rise Manet's Olympia to the level of not a nude, but a naked figure? By which Berger means to, among other things, suggest figures that have their own personality. And by having their own personality, 
resist our projections onto them. We no longer think of them as objects, you know, something just there for us. They are subjects, people in their own right, with their own feelings, their own concerns, their own desires, which we have to take into account. The other changes that have occurred here highlight ideas about racial, in this case, or ethnic hegemony. In this case, the, the figure who performs the role of the servant here, bringing her prostitute mistress her flowers, is a woman of color. A woman of color would have been the only one that a prostitute could hire because they were cheap labor for her servitude. So it brings in the question of these hierarchies based upon ethnicity and of race. There is even, and it's, it's almost difficult for me to point out, an association being made by Manet with these flowers in the hand of the woman of color, a woman from the East Indies, with an idea that was very prevalent in the 19th century, that women of color, particularly women from Africa, uh, were hypersexual, overly sexualized, which was confirmed, as they say, of course, it was pseudoscience, by studies of their genitalia, which were apparently considered to be enlarged and therefore leading naturally as a biological condition to their hypersexuality. In front of this picture and this viewing dynamic as well, remember, we're not the ideal lover. We're being seen by this figure, but we're also being seen in a way that doesn't make us particularly comfortable, does it? We are being judged. We have to think about ourselves in this position as the lowly John in front of this woman trying to solicit her sexual favors. We brought her the flowers, but she doesn't seem all that happy about it, does she? So how do we feel in front of this? One of the things that I like to point out, and there are many differences between this and Titian's work, is that one of the things Manet seems to have been trying to do is draw attention to the way that the tradition of the female nude helps men to feel comfortable in the face of something that they desire, which, as I've said over and again, is something that produces anxiety. We actually know that if you're in front of a beautiful woman, or a woman that you find beautiful, of course, you are likely to have released into your bloodstream cortisol, a type of hormone that literally reduces your IQ by about 20 points. So not a comfortable place to be uh, at all. And what Manet seems to have been doing, among other things, is drawing our attention to the way that the female nude makes us feel comfortable in the face of something that we desire in terms of the tradition of the female nude. This is not the case, of course, with his own painting, where we feel contested by the female nude, feel unsecure again, and have to wonder about how many times our belittling or objectification or diminishing of the humanity of women which has been historically conditioned, is based upon the idea of they are there for us. Now, there are a lot of things that we covered in today's lecture that will be picked up and fleshed out, so to speak, uh, next week when we go into the lecture on the first group of feminist artists in the United States. Uh, so what I'd invite you to do at this mo moment is to look back over this chart and think of how many times in the images that I've shown you those qualities associated with women naturally on the right hand column can be found in the works that I covered. Thank you very much and I'll see you next week.